Let's see if I scream. 
Yes. You guys all gonna do this way? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me if I talk like this? Yes. Everybody? Yeah. Okay. So our talk is on balance basics and fall prevention. I'm a big statistics guy, so I like to look at the numbers and try to figure out what's going on, especially for us as a country. So we look, and this comes out of CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Solutions. They tell us that falls are now the leading cause of both fatal and non fatal injuries among our older Americans. They threaten to senior safety and independence and generate enormous economic and personal costs. In 2019, the last year that we had data, falls among adults 65 and older caused over 34,000 deaths. For reference, that's roughly the same amount of people that died in all car accidents on all the roads in our country that year. Okay, so it's become a big issue. So, and in that same year, 2019, emergency departments reported 3 million falls from our older Americans. Now, the reason that we're having this discussion, we're talking about it, is because our government now sees this through Medicare. Right, as the taxpayer, they're all helping to put the bill for these falls. They said that in 2005, all the falls generated an economic cost to our country of $350 million. As you can see, eight years later, by 2013, that $350 million had ballooned to $34 billion. And by 2020, we're up to $67.7 billion that's being spent on falls and the results of those falls. So whether they be hospitalizations, rehab, following the falls, medical surgeries, and everything that goes along with that. So it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue that we need to address. We project that by the year 2030, we'll average as a country seven fall deaths every hour. Okay. And you can see where that line going up from, this is 2007 to 2016, how that line is called, is uh, turning upward and becoming more of an issue. So why is it relevant to us? We see that one out of five falls, roughly one out of five to one out of four falls, results in a serious injury. Serious injuries are defined as ones that bring you to the ER. The most common injury that you're going to get is a fracture, so a broken bone, and or a head injury with like TBI. Now every 19 minutes, we have a severe die to one, die due to one of those falls. The most common way that somebody's going to have a fatality is because they hit their head on some heart, they have a brain bleed, something goes wrong. Um, something that we'll also get on later on is that fractures, while being not only being detrimental to our, our function, our mortality, our mobility, um, they can also have serious life threatening consequences as well. Uh, we all know the story of you know, poor grandma who falls and she breaks her hip. Well, the statistics tell us that anybody who's over the age, any woman who's over the age of 65, if she were to fall and break her hip, there's about a 50% mortality in the next 12 months after she breaks her hip. Right? That is to say, if you fall and break your hip, it's a 50 50 chance that you're still going to be with us 12 months from now. Because it's such a traumatic experience between the most likely to be the surgery, the rehab center, the physical therapy, everything that comes after it is so traumatic that we have a hard time getting over that. So, what can we do about it? Now, me as a physical therapist, in particular a physical therapist who runs a balance center, I often get asked the question, okay, what can I do about it? I know that maybe some people are afraid of falls, maybe they've already had a fall, or they just have an elevated risk of that fall. So what do we do about it? Well, the good news is that falls are definitely not an inevitable part of aging. There's a number of things that you can do, and these are kind of data points given to us by CMS, so by the federal government, saying, hey, what, what are the evidence-based reactions to decrease our prevalence and risk of falls in the country? Number one, we say evidence-based interventions, which comes down to physical therapy for strength training, balance, and proprioceptive training. Um, it can also be going to your physician to say, hey, maybe I'm just your lightheaded because of a certain medication I'm taking, or maybe there's some sort of vitamin deficiency on that. So we want to get in front of a medical provider to figure out what's the cause of this imbalance. That's number one. Number two, practical lifestyle adjustments that we're going to go over in a little bit here. Altering and changing things in and around our home to reduce the prevalence of the likelihood of having a fall. 
Uh, the third one is clinic and community partners, which is essentially what we're doing here today. Trying to get out of the community and provide education and resources to reduce the risk and the problems of these falls. So, prevention is key. The vast majority of these falls, when I talk about falls, people often imagine falling down the stairs, falling off the ladder, falling from something high. The reality is the vast majority of these falls are from ground level. They start small and slow, you sway and get off balance, and then we have to fall. If you think logically, right, the definition of a fall is when your center of mass goes beyond your base of support. And so if we have our feet really close together, if we're standing on one leg, if there's something slippery to slip underneath us, and all of a sudden our center of mass is beyond our base of support, and you don't have the agility, the strength, and the wherewithal to bring your center of mass back on your base of support, that's when we have a fall. Now our balance, just like a muscle, we like to say it's use it or lose it. Right? Your muscles, if you were to go lay down for three months and then try to stand up and, and lift the couch, you're going to have a hard time. Right? Because your muscles deteriorate over time. Unfortunately, the balance system is the exact same. If you don't actively test it and actively work on it, it's going to deteriorate and get worse over time. We're going to go over in a little bit here the different components of what makes a balance system. But in general, there are three systems that give your brain information to keep yourself upright. The first one is your vestibular system. So your inner ear, it helps to tell us torque and acceleration as you move your head in all directions. The second one we call it proprioception. That's your feet as they hit the ground. You can feel the ground underneath you. As I lean to the left, those pressure sensors on the outside of my foot tell my brain I'm leaning and send signals to the other muscles on the other side of my foot to pull myself back in, the proprioception. The third one is eyesight, right? So as I see the world, I can tell where everything's upright. Those three systems are all required to work in sync, in unison, to send signals to our brain and keep us upright. Now, unfortunately, as we age, age we tend to lose some of that proprioception. That can be due to neuropathy in our feet. That can be due to um, any lack of sensation from any injury or past surgery. Um, it could just be due to the fact that, hey, we're not out there running on soccer fields like we used to, and we're not as agile and quick as we used to be. The second one is that we know our inner ear, our vestibular system. It's made up of many little different hair cells that all detect and sense motion as we move around. Well, as we get older, as we go through our decades, you have less and less hair cells within that inner ear. And the reactiveness, or the amount of information that inner ear is going to send your brain decreases over time. So what we have to do is compensate for that by training our feet and our agility all the more. Okay? Um, some helpful hints. This is something I, I try to tell everybody to find in my point. If you don't know um, the state of your bone health, or your bone density now, that's something that you should be talking to your doctor about. Um, by the time you get on Medicare, the schedule is every three to five years, in particular for women, that they should be giving you a DEXA scan, right? Which really just tells you, hey, am I osteoporotic or do I have osteopenia? Because if you do have one of those things, if you don't have strong and healthy bones, right, it's all the more likely that if you were to fall, that we're going to break something or we're going to have a big issue. Um, I tell a story just last week, my mom was playing pickleball. She falls out on her wrist, breaks her wrist. We had a surgery last week. And I tell her, hey, you gotta go in and get your dexa scan, you gotta figure this out. And she goes in, yeah, sure enough, she has osteopenia. Okay, well, if we're taking care of that earlier on, maybe when you fell, you wouldn't have broken that bone. Right? We want to have as strong a bone, as strong a body as possible. So I encourage everybody to go in and get that checked if you don't know. Um, the next one, the really easy thing around the house is just keeping things organized. I've been in a lot of houses and everybody does things a little differently. But if you have any of these pro rugs, regardless of how pretty or how decorative they might be, that's how everybody can get real. Right? If you're stepping over that rug and the little corner gets turned up and you just can't get it to lay flat, get rid of it. Okay? It's not doing us any good. Every time you step over that 10, 20, 30, 50 times a day, it's just an increased likelihood that you're going to catch your toe on it at one point. Whether when the lights are out or you're not paying attention or whatever it is. It's not worth the risk. The other one, you'll get this picture on the right with that cranked arm crease. Not everybody has the same ability. 
um, to repair the cracked concrete, but if you can, if you can change that now, I encourage people to do it now before it gets too late. Um, you don't want to be thinking about a cracked concrete when you're laying on it because you just fell over on it. But, but it's the same thing that you're going to cross over that 5, 10, 15 times a day for the next 10 plus years. It's just an incident and an uh, opportunity again and again and again to have a fall. So you want to get that taken care of sooner rather than later. Um, when we look around the house, we talk about getting rid of clutter and just keeping everything tidy. Really the big reason for that for me is that we look over here and the picture on the right just gives me anxiety. Anytime you have this stuff on your floor, right? Just like a rug where the corners turn up, it's just an opportunity for you to catch your foot on something or you step on it and there goes the friction between you and the ground and you fly right back. Right? It might seem very simple and kind of mundane, and yes, it definitely is. But I couldn't tell you how many people I've had in my clinic who have come either post op or just post a fall, and it's because of something like this, something that was relatively preventable. So when we look at a house and we talk about clutter, we're looking at newspapers that might get thrown all over the place. You see the uh, throw rug right over here, number two throw rug on that um, uh, a blanket on the couch. Um, and then number four over here is cords. So if you have any electrical cords, any drop cords, any lamps that are positioned throughout your room, get rid of them, move them, you want nothing under your feet. The other big one is that if you have any transitions in your house for flooring, so if you go from carpet to tile or to wood or whatever it is, you want that transition to be as low profile as possible. I've seen some that are up to you know, like half inch to an inch tall, and it's almost a step. You have to be aware of every time you step over. So anything you do to adjust that and change that would be ideal. Um, the Senior Services Center, Will County, if you need any help, they have some gentlemen that are on step, not step, I call there. Um, they're handymen who specialize in this kind of thing. They can help to adjust or change your house. They can help to put in ramps. They can help to put in grab bars and slip bars all over the place. Um, so you can always call over there. And I know they have a sliding scale of financial assistance that they'll provide um, based on what you need. Um, so here's our, our quiz. Where in your home, where do you guys think is the room that I wish the most falls occur? Bathroom. Bathroom, everybody. Yep. So the bathroom, slate, it's most likely to have water. The other big one, we talked about those three systems by which your body derives balance, right? The inner ear, your proprioception for your feet, and your eyes. Well, the bathroom is the number one place where you're going to close your eyes because you're washing your hair or you're scrubbing your body or whatever it might be. And if you don't have a great inner ear, because it's not as reactive as it once was, if you don't have very reactive and strong proprioception or stability in your feet, then it's a very common practice that people that they get over 65 become really dependent on their eyesight. Because that's the one thing that we can control pretty well, right? You can get glasses, you can get LASIK, you can do whatever, we can control our eyesight. So now you become over-reliant on your eyesight to balance. And that's all fine and well until you get to the point that you close your eyes because you're in the bathroom and shower, or maybe it's dark out and you don't have the light that you once did, and that's when we see our faults. So really in the bathroom, and then at nighttime, or anytime you can't use your eyes. Um, so in the bathroom, what can we do to decrease our risk of falls? We already talked about grab bars. I like to have grab bars everywhere, right? In general, there are two types, two main types of grab bars that you'll see. Um, one is a suction cup, that if you have tile, you don't have to drill into the tile or make a hole, it's a suction cup. I get nervous with those, I don't tend to trust it. If you're falling and you've got to grab onto this thing, your whole body weight's going through this, this grab bar, I wouldn't trust a suction cup. Um, the other alternative is that you got to drill into it, right? Everybody's bathroom is a little different if you have to drill in the tile or not, but you want these things everywhere just in case. Um, the other one, a non-slip tub surface or a mat. So you can get, depending on the tub or a shower, you can get different grip surfaces for the ground to give yourself a little more friction. Um, and then also this non-slip bath mat. So just like the rugs that we have in our room, living room, that have a tendency for the corner to get flipped up and just give you something to catch your foot on. In the bathroom, you have the exact same thing. So I like to encourage, they have these, um, they're pretty cheap, they're, they're stone bath mats. They're made out of this hard, porous stone material that's 
dries super quick. Right? You pour water on it and it looks like it's dry within seconds. These things are solid in the rock, they're actually stone, and so they're never going to get flipped up. You can find them on Amazon for as cheap as I think 20 or 30 bucks. That's why I encourage people to get it. And they're, they're non slick surface, so it's nice and big to be good for um, The other one is the night light. Again, if we're over dependent on our eyesight for balance, you want to have lights everywhere, all over your house. Uh, and then the final one is that if, if it's an issue, you don't need to mode or raise seat. The number one spot, the deepest squat anybody's going to have to get out of is coming from their toilet seat. Right, so you need to raise that up and go ahead and get something to help us out. So those are all good, helpful hit, um, hints and tips to adjust your environment in your house to reduce your risk of fall. But then what else can you do outside of that? Right? Because just if everything is all perfect in your house, that doesn't mean your risk of having a fall is going to be zero. Um, I don't have any risk of fall, right? But I can walk out the door and I can trip over the grip and kind of fall today. Right? The risk is never going to zero, so we want to do everything we can to reduce that risk as much as possible. So what do we do? Number one, exercise is medicine. Everybody should be exercising every day, regardless of age, regardless of ability level. The uh, American Heart Association recommends that we get 150 minutes of moderate exercise and activity every week. That moderate activity could be easy as going on a walk, it could be lifting light weights, it could be playing with your grandkids. But 150 minutes a week at a minimum is what the American Heart Association recommends. Okay. On top of that, we want regular strength training and flexibility. I just had it last month. I had a gentleman who's in his 40s who slipped and fell and his leg went out in front of him. And this guy was just, he was a plumber and he was sick. And so he hadn't been stretched his hamstrings. And so he tore his hamstrings. And he was coming into the therapy and he was there for a number of weeks because he wasn't flexible enough. But if he had just been stretching his hamstring, he probably would have slipped, stood right back up, and went on his way. Right? So easy stuff that we can do right now. So we look at physical therapy. We already talked about those three sensory systems. The goal of physical therapy, if you do think you're a fall risk, is that we want to look at those three different systems and determine which one is giving you an issue. Is it your inner ear? Is it the vestibular issue? Is it that you have neuropathy and you don't have the reactiveness or the proprioception that you want, once had? Or is there something else going on that needs medical intervention from your doctor? Um, one of the most common causes of dizziness and lightheadedness is just polypharmacy. So if you have three or more medications that you take on a regular basis, Chances are that those medicines probably interact with each other to provide some sort of dizziness or lightheadedness to you. And if we can adjust, if we can talk to your doctor and adjust those medications, then that's something you don't want to do. Because your doctors don't want you to have a fall either. You might notice every time you go to your doctor, it's either they ask you the question or it's on a form where they say, hey, I haven't had a fall in the last 12 months. Well, that's because again, Medicare requires that they screen out for that. And if you say, yeah, doc, I had a fall last month, Okay, now they're required to address it, whether through a change in medication or education or physical therapy or whatever it might be. One of the easiest ways to screen this out for yourself, you might be thinking, hey, am I at a risk for a fall? I don't know. Maybe I feel strong, but I haven't had a fall yet. Well, great. Again, the government, CMS, has spent a good amount of money and time on research trying to figure out, hey, what are some easy tests we can do to screen ourselves and try to determine if we're at an elevated risk of fall? Okay, they have the data of hundreds of thousands and millions of people who are on Medicare and who had falls, and they can see, hey, if you're not at a certain level of strength or a certain level of stability, you're at a significantly elevated risk of having a fall. So we have these easy tests to screen out. This first one, 30 second time chair test. So all we're doing is going from sitting to standing out of a standard chair, which is about 22 to 24 inches, just like the one you're sitting in. Without using your hands, we go up and down over the course of 30 seconds. And you say, hey, how many times can I do that? Now you see these scores, these are just averages for men and women as we go along the decades. We want to get you to at least 12 times that you can go up and down over the course of 30 seconds. If it's taking you more than, or if you can do, if you can't do 12 repetitions,
attention to that, that's a good sign that you're at an elevated risk of fall. Because people who aren't strong and fast enough to do that at least 12 times, those are the people who are weaker, less stable, and statistically much more likely to have an issue. The next one is a single leg stance, so just the ability to stand on one leg without holding on to anything. Yeah. The goal that I have for all my patients is at least 30 seconds on each leg. We know that if you can't do it for at least 10 seconds, Medicare considers you a fall risk, and you're statistically more likely to have an issue in the next 12 months. Um, I used to work with a primary care physician that it was his goal for all his patients that they'd be able to stand on one leg and change their shoe and sock on the opposite foot. <laughs> and that's all that they're actually getting, because that's hard to do. Right? But if you have the stability and whatever fall to do that, falls are going to be the least of your concern. We talk about flexibility. These are some easy stretches. We want to be stretching out every day your calf, which is what this girl is doing over here on the left, and your hamstring, which is what the girl over there on the right is doing. Okay? We call this the posterior chain. It's just the muscles that come up behind you. If I need to take a normal gait stride or a normal step forward, you see how my back foot here, my right toes come up to my shin. Okay, that's called dorsiflexion. I need a minimum of 10 degrees of dorsiflexion to have a normal gait pattern and a normal stride. If you have any less than that, that leads you to shuffling your feet because you can't come forward as far, you don't have the flexibility in your ankles, and that's what causes you to catch your toe on something. Right? So we want a normal gait stride and a normal gait pattern, and you do that through stretching every single day. Unfortunately, as we get older, there are two types of collagen that make up your connective tissues, type 1 and type 2. As we're younger, we have majority type 1 collagen, which is much more elastic and allows for more flexibility as we're younger. Well, as we get older, that type 1 collagen gets replaced more and more readily with type 2 collagen, which is more rigid, it's less elastic, and that's part of what makes us so stiff as we get older. So we combat that with stretching. Stretching not only increases the flexibility of that connective tissue, but it actually increases the length of your muscles, so you actually get longer, bigger muscles by the stretching. Um, the other easy thing is we want to start strengthening a little bit. These are very low-level baseline issues for people who are already having trouble walking. This over here is called a quad set. All you're doing is contracting that muscle as hard as you can. You hold for about three to five seconds and then relax. I do this oftentimes to my post-op people that are so low-level or low-functioning that they have a hard time even walking around. That next one over there is called a seated knee extension or a long arm quad. From a sitting position, all you're doing is extending that leg. Thereby contracting. <laughs> Thereby contracting your quad. Um, and using that quad muscle again. Okay? Again, these are really easy, simple exercises, but it's a base level of starting. If you can do that, and it's pretty easy, the next level up, my favorite exercise for people, are sit to stands. So you go from sitting to standing, up and down. <laughs> <laughs> and you can get up to 15 times in a row, sit to stand, up and down, that's our goal, right? And then again, at least 12 within 30 seconds, okay? It's the easiest, safest thing you can do. God forbid, worst case scenario, you fall, or you just sit back in your chair, right? So it's a nice, safe thing. Um, other easy ones, people can visit in bed before they get out, um, get out of bed in the morning. We call them leg raises. You go all three directions. So doing a leg raise from your back, doing a leg raise from your side, and then doing a leg raise that you can handle laying your stomach, and do a leg raise from your stomach too. What this is doing is working your hip flexors, your hip abductors, and your hip extenders. One of the biggest issues people have, the weakness that we see, is weakness in around the hip. We call it a lumbar pelvic hip, it's your hip or foot. And we gotta be working on that every day. Um, the other thing, lifting techniques, this is pretty similar to that sit to stand that I was talking about. If you can't squat to the ground and pick up a full basket of laundry, Medicare considers that functionally deficient enough that you would qualify for physical therapy. Right? We should all be able to squat to the ground in a good form, pick up a 20 pound box or a full basket of laundry, and stand back up without fear of losing our balance or falling over. The other easy one is just a lunge. Okay, anybody can do this. You grab on something steady, step out in front of you, and you just go down and back. 
and all you're doing is drawing that opposite knee in the direction of the ground. You don't have to get all the way down, so this is a great exercise to feel both on the left leg, the leg that's stepping forward, and also the back leg, and then you switch around. For all of these, I tend to shoot for, hey, let's do 15 in a row. You want to push yourself to the point where you start to feel your muscles fatigue and get a little tired and burn. That's how you know you're doing it well. Um, so that was, a, that was a whole presentation. I, I do have one video um, left off that we loaded here of a real life success story. This is a man in Traverse City, Michigan, who went to one of these physical therapy and balance centers. He's 95 years old. Um, he started having falls, and he was getting very worried about the injuries that were going to result from those falls. So he sought physical therapy, and they put him through kind of a treatment pattern, and they, they documented his whole uh, process. So we're going to watch that video.
So I think I was 59, I'm 62 now. And I fell 12 times in one year. My feet, my ear, it was not working. Oh, also I should mention, I have fibromyalgia, which is a pain condition from head to toe. Um, so I've done a lot of physical therapy over 28 years. I met Kyle at Challenge Fitness. Um, we did a breakfast and he came in and talked and I thought, this guy was so smart. So I started going to him and he got me back in order so quickly. And the thing that you may have noticed with physical therapy yourself is sometimes, okay, <laughs> I want to be, you yeah. um, know, is like I would go to a physical therapist that I liked and then she'd pass me off to an assistant and then I'd get passed off to a college kid <laughs> and they would hurt me because like Kyle watches me like a hawk. If, if I'm not doing my walking correctly, he will stop me, tell me what's going on so my brain can get a hold of it. And also the harness. It's awesome. Oh, wow. It's awesome. We have you know, uh, someone here, and I'm not going to point them out, that uses it. My sisters use it. It is fabulous. So if you're afraid of going to physical therapy, don't be afraid. And he's also really, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> but he does make you do your work. And that's all I have to say. He does make you work.